I'll, I'll add them in. So welcome everyone. This is our uh, fifth Bite Size Research webinar. Um, you are all muted and uh, as with previous webinars, if you've joined us, if we could ask you just to stay on mute, please, just so we don't have background noise. Um, obviously throughout the webinar, if you have any questions for our speakers or for um, even us as a team, for Zoe or for Vicky, uh, please use the chat function. Uh, we encourage you to keep the chat function open on another pane if you can, um, but pop your questions in there and uh, we will do our best to make sure we answer them all at the end after the presentations. Um, there are no silly questions, obviously please do fire any questions that you have for our speakers away as you get them and if you think of anything afterwards you can always email us as well and we'll do our best to get back to you after the webinar. Um, just before I hand over to Zoe to introduce our speakers today I just want to thank a few people. So this project that you're hearing about today um, was purely only made possible because of a number of things. So um, it wasn't a planned PhD, it was, a, it was a, an exceptional PhD as judged by our independent scientific advisory panel and therefore we wanted to fund it in addition to um, a PhD that we'd got planned. So what we decided to do was launch an appeal to try and raise the funds to uh, actually obviously take the project forward and actually within a few weeks we managed to raise or secure £100,000 to make this project possible back in 2018. So for anyone on, on this webinar that actually donated to that appeal, you helped make that possible. But also uh, the Neger family and everyone at the Three L's Trust, they contributed quite considerably to make the project possible, as did the Kreitman family and everyone at the Balcom Trust, um, and the Gould family, and a big shout out to Pete Lloyd, who is one of our patient ambassadors who actually fronted that appeal for us. So we just wanted to give a shout out to everyone that did make that possible. So often our supporters do wonder where their money goes. This is a shining example that actually without the support of our supporters and the donations of our supporters, this project wouldn't have been possible. So um, anyway, I'm going to hand over to Zoe now to introduce uh, our speakers. Hi everyone, welcome to our uh, fifth webinar. Um, it gives me a great pleasure um, this week to introduce another one of our PhD, PhD students, Hannah Spencer, and she is joined with one of her supervisors, Professor Robert Falconer. So they join us uh, from the Institute of Cancer Therapeutics at Bradford University, um, where Hannah is a PhD student and Rob is Professor of Medicinal Chemistry. Um, so they're going to talk to you today about a PhD project looking at um, trying to make methotrexate less, less toxic. So I'll hand over to Hannah and Rob. Thanks Zoe. So Hannah, are you going to... Yeah, I'm just sharing them now. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks for allowing Hannah and I into your living rooms and to your spare rooms and kitchens. Uh, and I'd just like to echo um, all the thanks, uh, first of all, to, to Matt and to Zoe and to Vicky for inviting us along to talk to you today and to all the supporters who've made this project possible for us and, and for the trust in believing in something that we're quite passionate about. So. Hannah's going to tell you about her PhD project, which is focused on uh, methotrexate. Um, and first of all, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction into our institute and some of the history, how we linked to some of the early work on chemotherapy, and then just a little bit of background to the project. And then I'm going to hand over to Hannah, who's going to walk you through her, her project uh, and all the details there afterwards. So Hannah, next slide thanks so so bradford's actually got quite a history um in terms of uh, chemotherapy development so methotrexate is obviously the focus today uh methotrexate is one of the earliest uh successful chemotherapy drugs that we all know has significant side effects and actually when it was developed it was really um, a massive improvement on, on some of the drugs that were being used at the time back in the 1950s so there were two key individuals at Bradford uh, and the Bradford Royal Infirmary in particular um, I'd like to mention. So first of all, George White Watson, who was a surgeon 
and Robert Lowry Turner, who was a pathologist. And these two uh, gentlemen teamed up and undertook some of what would now be considered some of the earliest uh, clinical trials for new chemotherapy agents. And that was uh, for breast cancer treatment. As you can see, this is a, a newspaper cutting from the Yorkshire Observer back in 1959. I think it's fair to say that they, they were met with some scepticism, shall we say, from uh, the medical community. Um, you know, that who, what's a surgeon doing messing around with cancer drugs and what's a pathologist doing out of the lab, all that, that kind of thing. But ultimately, they were proved right. They saved many lives. And indeed, their, their work is now commemorated as a, there's a picture of the plaque there that you can find in Bradford Cathedral, actually, which commemorates the, the early work that they did uh, back in 1959. So the link to the Institute is that Robbie La Robert Lowry Turner was made professor of cancer um, back in the 1970s. And he set up a lab uh, in our Richmond building, which is our main um, uh, teaching building in, in the university, teaching research building. And that grew ultimately into our Institute of Cancer Therapeutics that we inhabit today. So here you can see a picture of our, of our building. And in fact, it was nice to welcome some of you uh, to our open day last year, some, some of the patients and supporters. Uh, and hopefully we'll do something again in the future when things return back to normal. But essentially, we're able to undertake all aspects of the cancer drug discovery process. So from making compounds, so we have chemistry labs, so making potential new drugs through to screening them in the laboratory setting. So are they effective, trying to predict how they're going to be broken down once they're in the body? And also getting an early steer on whether they're selective for cancer. So that, that's an important element of what Hannah's going to talk to you about uh, in a little bit. So we're able to get an early steer on that and then move on to more complex systems. So how the drugs actually interact with cells and tissues and, and more complex models. And finally, uh, we have a lab which is uh, focused on lab support for St. James's Hospital in the Leeds. And I noticed that Paul Oedman is, is in the audience today. Hello, Paul. Uh, and that is focused, and Amanda actually as well, who's the, the researcher who's doing a lot of these studies. So that's focused on uh, analysing clinical samples, so blood samples, urine samples from, from patients that are uh, trialling new drugs. So, so we're able to, as I say, to, to cover all aspects of, of developing new drugs in our, in our institute. So next slide. Thanks, Hannah. So Hannah's going to focus on methotrexate today. Um, and you will have heard and you'll be aware that there are lots of new exciting treatments coming along. There's, you've heard about immunotherapy in one of the webinars recently. But it's fair to say that chemotherapy, by which we mean that the older drugs like methotrexate, doxorubicin and so on, that these drugs are going to be continued to be used in, in the short to medium term. Uh, and we all know that they, they cause some quite nasty side effects sometimes. Where it, there's some selectivity because cancer cells divide much more rapidly than normal cells, but ultimately a lot of our normal cells are, are affected. So that of course means that patients are going to become sick because of the side effects and then the doses need to be reduced and so patients are not getting the amounts of drug that they need for successful therapy. So if we are able to target these chemotherapy drugs selectively to tumours, there's an opportunity for less side effects and equally importantly for better outcomes because more drug will get to the tumour. And as I've said at the bottom of that slide there, there's also an opportunity if that technology is available to look at drugs that are otherwise sitting on shelves in drug companies and universities that have been shown to be just too toxic for use in patients. The, the side effects are just too severe, but, oh, but they're very, very good cancer drugs. So if you're able to deliver them selectively, then it could re reinvigorate drugs that otherwise um, can't be used. So that's just a little background from me. And now Hannah is going to take you through uh, her PhD project. So over to you, Hannah. Okay, so I'm first going to start with just a little bit of background and um, just to take you through some of the things that Rubber Such done. Um, as I know that a lot of you are already aware about osteosarcoma and how 
it actually affects patients um, and also about methotrexate. Um, but just for those who aren't aware, I'll just take you through quite a brief history of that. Um, so osteosarcoma is actually the most common form of primary, primary malignant bone tumour. And it has its highest prevalence in children with the majority of cases in individuals under the age of 20. Uh, so the survival rate uh, for those who actually have developed osteosarcoma, it hasn't really improved very much over the past 30 years. And this has been pinpointed down to the lack of new therapies being introduced, um, as Rob has also uh, touched upon. Um, and that's especially important for those who have developed metastases. So individuals with osteosarcoma, they're conventionally treated with surgery, um, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is often given before and after surgery to try and improve the patient outcomes. So methotrexate, um, so how does methotrexate actually work? So it's an anti-metabolite of folic acid and folic acid is actually important in helping your body, your body to produce and maintain cells. What methotrexate does is it inhibits um, dihydrofolic reductase, which is a protein that is responsible for breaking down this folic acid into molecules that are used in DNA synthesis and the regulation of gene expression. So this inhibition of dihydrofolic reductase inevitably results in the death of cells um, that are actively growing. And as many of you are aware, cancer cells grow more rapidly than others, um, than other healthier cells and therefore the drug is able to exhibit its strongest effects against cancer cells. Um, also in addition to this, the affinity of this reductase protein um, for methotrexate is actually much greater than that of folic acid, which is why it is able to exhibit such toxic effects and why it has such great long-standing effects. And so side effects um, are actually a result of this um, affecting both the normal cells and the cancer cells, regardless of its selectivity. Um, so it affects normal cells, cancer cells, significant side effects, which are, after talking to patients, some of the ones that are actually most impactful are those that affect, so that cause mouth ulcers. Um, and what they do generally after methotrexate is given is they administer a dose of leucoverin. And leucoverin actually helps to reduce these side effects by introducing a molecule that acts just downstream of the methotrexate activity, so downstream of this dihydrofolate reductase. And its aim is to actually help cells to recover from methotrexate therapy. Okay. So prodrugs, as Rob has actually touched on as well, um, so prodrugs are compounds that undergo a transformation before they're actually able to exhibit their effects. And these inactive chemical derivatives are activated both enzymatically, so by the use of a protein as we do, or non-enzymatically, which is sometimes to do with acid in your stomach or other, other mechanisms. And we should note that approximately 10% of the marketed drugs that are available are actually prodrugs. So Rob actually mentioned a chemotherapy prodrug um, earlier, and that's cyclophosphamide. Um, and that's used in the likes of lymphoma. Um, but also common drugs like codeine, they are actually prodrugs. So how is this actually relevant to us? Um, so it's, uh, the way in which it's applied is to improve this drug stability. So it actually prevents the rapid metabolism of the drug. So if it is too active and um, you can slow this down, it's used to target delivery towards proteins that we know are overexpressed in these osteosarcoma cells. This, we can use it to target it towards those. And this in turn helps to make the drug less toxic. So with the drug being non-toxic in the bloodstream and then being toxic only when it reaches the site, um, it allows for a better and kinder solution towards chemotherapy. Okay, so what actually is our aim? So our aim is to produce a new chemically modified methotrexate prodrug, something that is sequence specific. Um, and we do this by looking at the active site of the proteins that we actually target. And these have been studied extensively. And we use this as a basis for the prodrug design. So the targeted, the proteins are targeted towards, um, that we target are overexpressed massively in osteosarcoma tumors. Um, and this increases the ability of the drug to actually kill the osteosarcoma cells. 
Um, and also it means that it's localized in the tumor because of the non-toxic nature of the prodrug in the bloodstream. And um, we're also able to reduce the side effects and therefore improving the quality of life of, of the patients um, and making the drug much kinder to them. So we actually utilize a protein that is present in some of the most aggressive tumors. So matrix metalloproteinases uh, specifically, uh, they actually recognize specific regions of the tissue. And what they do is they act as scissors. So they cut open the extracellular matrix and they enable the tumor to escape and to metastasize. And MMPs have been shown to be overexpressed in a lot of different kinds of tumors. Um, but there have been many studies that have also shown that in osteosarcoma, MMP14 specifically, which is the one that we target, is massively overexpressed, which is why it is a good example of a target for us. So what is actually our approach? So as Rob mentioned, we do straight from chemistry, from synthesis, right the way through to the osteosarcoma models in vivo. And we, have, we do have these links with different organizations as well. So phase one, um, I'll take you through a brief overview and then I'll go a little bit more in detail. So we synthesize the compounds, uh, we screen them, um, and what the screening allows us to see is the level of tumor activation, uh, the tissue, the stability in normal tissue. And then it's also, we actually look at the, the cleaver, how it's cleaved by different MMPs and whether it's cleaved by other proteins in, in our actual assay as well. And we constantly are jumping between these two phases because sometimes a change that you make, although you have the best intentions of making it more stable, it can have the opposite effect. Uh, so these two are quite essential and we do jump between those. And we only take target our lead compounds through to these detailed osteosarcoma models. And the osteosarcoma models allow us to measure the actual drug concentration that is reaching the tumor and the normal tissues in real time. And it also lets us see how effective the drug is at killing these tumors and monitor the different side effects. So I'll take you through um, the synthesis stage. So how does it actually start out? So we look, so there's been many studies looking at the sequences of MMP14 substrates, and that actually provides us with a very good foundation for the design of new drugs. We've had a previous PhD student in the lab that created a library of sequences that were recognized by MMP14 and those that were not. So what we did um, was we used these sequences and we built upon them, adding the methotrexate and then going forward into the biological screening. But I'll just take you through each step by step and what it actually involves. So we actually create these peptides um, using a solid phase peptide synthesis. But what does this actually involve? So it's, we take two amino acids to start with, um, and if you can think of these as the building blocks of proteins, and we react these building blocks together. So first you have to start off by deprotecting this building block to allow them to react. And it does this by using the carboxylic acid and the amine group um, of the amino acids. And then once they've bound together, um, we will then move on to the next amino acid, adding more and more until we get the sequence that we actually desire. So once we have the sequence, we move on to actually attaching the methotrexate to the molecule. And for, you can see here that methotrexate is actually, if you separate it, it's in two parts. You have a glutamic acid, which is one of these amino acids that we actually have as part of our sequence. And then we have a petroic acid part. So we use this carboxylic acid here to attach the glutamic acid onto the end of the peptide. And then after that, we will then deprotect this again and react on the petroic acid. Um, this isn't very easy and um, we do have a lot of issues with solubility. So we have to use activators. In this case, we use bases um, to help the reaction along and um, just to make sure that we are getting a sufficient amount of the methotrexate onto the end of the peptide. Um, and then once we've got the sequence um, all completed with the methotrexate attached, we'll cleave and um, we'll cleave this from the resin that it, we have built it on. And cleavage involves using acids to remove the peptide from the resin and also break up, break off any of the protective groups. And the protective groups are there to prevent any of the other reactive chains from actually getting involved in the reaction. 
So once we've done this, and um, we'll go through to LCMS um, and HPLC, and we'll actually purify. So we'll first determine how pure the, so the actual solution is um, that we have got. Um, and then we'll use something called HPLC, which is liquid chromatography. And this is quite a tedious process as you have to make sure that you're only isolating the product. So any of the overlapping peaks, we have to try and stretch this out as much as possible using different techniques and different time scales to make sure that you don't get any of these unwanted products. And by changing the method, you're able to force those peaks apart, eventually isolating the peptide that you want to take forward or the prodrug. So we actually use in the library that we, we have already from the previous student, we identified a selection of the most favorable compounds and the ones, those that are actually selectively released in the tumors. And we know that some of the amino acids within this sequence are vital in the recognition of the sequence. Um, but then we also know that others are vital for stability. So in the sequence, we have the core sequence and then we will change small parts of this sequence to try and make it more specific towards the MMP14 that we target. But in addition to this, uh, we also look at uh, the protective end cap and the effects of changing this has on the stability and the recognition of the prodrug. And this is what we're moving towards at the moment. And um, so we're moving towards using a protective end cap that is actually more natural than those that we've used in the past. And this, this does involve a lot of trial and error, as what has previously worked for others doesn't necessarily work for us. But we're not going to let this hold us back. And we are currently in the process of finding a cap that is more successful than the previous ones and more natural. So then phase two, we go on to biological screening. And we do this using xenograft tissue. And what xenograft tissue is, is where human cell lines have been implanted into mice. And then the tumors that develop are extracted. And we use this tissue um, in a few different ways that other people will measure the actual methotrexate release when you go into osteosarcoma models in this tumor. So what we do is we blend up the whole tissue in a buffered solution. And this allows for the proteins to be released into what we call the homogenate. So as the variety of proteins are very abundant in the likes of the liver and in the tumor tissue, it provides a good model to see how the drug will actually act in vivo. And it also provides a worst case scenario for what will happen if something were to go wrong. So then we go on to the next step. We add the prodrug to the tissue and um, to each individual tissue, and we mix it up to make sure that it's distributed evenly. And then at different time points, we'll actually take out a small amount of this tissue and we'll extract the metabolites and we do this in methanol. And um, so we will then spin this down. So we'll add methanol to here, we'll spin this down and then we'll take off just the methanol layer leaving the tissue behind. Okay. So at different time points, we do take out a small amount of the tissue and we extract the metabolites. And this tells us how much of the prodrug will actually remain in the sample over time. So just as an example, you can see here that in the liver, it's more stable, so you don't get as much, uh, you get a lot more of the prodrug seen across the, the time scale. And then in the tumor, you can see this is reducing more rapidly. So I'll just take you a little bit more in detail about this. So here is an actual trace that we have from one of our compounds. Um, and we take, so we have time point zero, 20, and 90. So at time point zero is the point of an initial exposure. And we use this as a standard to be able to see how much of the prodrug is available in that solution. And then we have this prodrug here. So what we don't see is the breakdown of the drug in normal tissues because it's specific to the MMPs, as I've mentioned. So here in normal tissues, we won't actually see a breakdown, but in tumor tissues, it's broken down into different parts. So here you can see a shorter chain with a, a less amount of these building blocks on it and the end cap has been broken off and this means that it's no longer protected. So in tumors this is rapidly broken down until methotrexate is released and this is done selectively in the tumor. So further to this, so here's an, here is an actual example of how we see the tissue specificity of the drug. 
So in the liver, you can see here that there is a lot, a lot of the non-toxic prodrug. And this is after a three hour assay. Um, but very, very little of the methotrexate has been released. In contrast, um, after the same amount of time um, in the tumour, we see that there is a very little of the non-toxic prodrug, but then we get lots of localised methotrexate release. Okay. So the osteosarcoma model. Um, so this is the next stage of our project, and we have actually had some successful, some really good data come out of an osteosarcoma model in the past with ICT-10101. Um, and after they measured the drug concentrations in this osteosarcoma model, and they were able to determine that this prototype was actually quite successful. And the measure of success was the methotrexate con concentrations that they saw in normal tissues in comparison to that that they saw in tumor tissues. So they saw a selective release of, in the tumor, but unfortunately this wasn't perfect. It wasn't a perfect model going forward. So what do we actually hope to achieve going forward? So we have seen a lot of promising results after the synthesis and biological testing of a, quite a number of compounds that we've produced. Uh, but what we have to do is we have to complete a lot more laboratory tests to make sure that these, pro these pro drugs are safer, they have fewer side effects than methotrexate and that they're actually more effective. And when it goes forward, uh, ready for advanced safety testing, and um, this actually involves the testing of the drug in human tissue samples. So I just want to here take the just a, a, the opportunity to thank those people who have actually donated their tumours in the past, um, or those of family and friends who have chosen to give their samples to science and um, to be able to allow um, things like this project to happen. So we are able to see what is going on in the tumours. Um, and then we're able to identify different targets. So on that note, so as you can see here, there is a little diagram just of the drug development process. And it does involve quite a lot of steps. So this is where we actually sit at the moment. So this is phase two and phase one and phase two of our project and phase three would be the in vivo studies. So we have the target selection primarily due to the mapping of different proteins that are within tumours. The lead discovery, we've taken forward some of our compounds that we've already shown to be successful and we're modifying those to make them more specific towards osteosarcoma cells over the normal cells. And then the biological screening just tells us all of these things, whether it is safer, whether there are fewer side effects and is it more effective than methotrexate. So, so we are hoping once we've completed all of these, these phases, um, to actually be able to obtain the crucial funding that we need to, to take these compounds forward into in vivo testing. And that just puts us one step closer into actually going into a clinical trial, um, something with patient, where patients are able to benefit from this drug. So I also want to just finally thank every single person who made this project possible. Uh, you're the reason that my project was funded and and I've tried to do my little bit to give back. Uh, the Three Peaks Challenge was quite fun. I think Ali is on this call as well and Luke. Um, and I think they can say that we definitely had a laugh that day. Um, and for those who, of you who came to visit, so Pete and um, to his kids as well, who I, I spoke to quite a lot at the conference. I even ended up in the swimming pool at eight in the morning. Um, and I hope to be able to continue my efforts to provide, uh, to give something back to you guys as well. So I just want to thank you there. And then if you do have any questions with regards to the project, then please don't hesitate to ask. Okay, I'm just gonna. Oh, quicker. Okay. Uh, hey, Hannah? Yeah. Wonderful, thank you ever so much. That's, it's really fascinating. It really is really fascinating project. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people on the on this webinar that has experienced or has witnessed the effects of methotrexate, they will know the benefits potentially of this far more than you know anyone. So it's really, really well done. Um, Vicky, do you want to take on the questions? Yes. So 
So as you know, sometimes we get questions sent in advance. Uh, so I'm going to put those to you first, and then I'll go through uh, some questions that people have asked uh, throughout while we're talking. So we got a question uh, sent to us by Elizabeth Schultz, and she, there's a little bit of background to the question. So uh, she's saying that uh, she experienced a pretty difficult week um, with uh, encephalopathy uh, related to uh, the high dose methotrexate uh, after her third cycle. Now, originally, so this had to be dropped because obviously she, she had this side effect. Um, so initially, her target was for six cycles. And so what she's asking is whether you are aware of any studies that support um, the actual number of cycles that are recommended for optimal treatment. And if so, how old those two studies are? Uh, so the Uremos is possibly one of the biggest um, trials that have looked into the different regimes used in, in, met in with methotrexate. Um, and they recommend having two cycles prior to your actual surgery and then having the remainder afterwards. And it is a six cycle process over six to nine cycles, depending on which type of map um, th chemotherapy regime that you use um, and then it's between 30 and 40 weeks but it does vary depending on patients because of the prognosis of patients if your prognosis is better um, or worse then you're given a different timeline to others and um, so it does vary between each patient I think I think that answers oh, yeah I think so so I actually have a question of my own, but follows on to that one, actually. Um, so um, clearly, she obviously had a, an encephalopathy because methotrexate can get to your brain. That's the reason why you get that side effect. So, are you, so do you think your approach will have an effect and therefore minimize, because you're trying to have a localized uh, release, would you achieve less CNS penetration? Uh, so what the actual aim is, is that we don't see that release of methotrexate in normal cells, so in the brain, in the kidney, where a lot of people do have problems with the likes of acute kidney injury, which is why a lot of patients have to go through the, the, the amount of preparation they do, like um, alkalizing their, their urine and making sure that they're hyperhydrated. And a little differences in, in these conditions can cause a lot of dramatic effects. So... Um, the likes of acute kidney injury, we do look at the release of our drugs in the kidney. We look at the release in the liver to be able to provide us with a model of whether or not these drugs are actually likely to be released. So it would, the hope is that you would not see um, as many side effects because methotrexate wouldn't be released and that you wouldn't actually get encephalopathy or if you do, it would be very minor in comparison to what it is currently. I don't know whether Rob wants to add anything. I'm just, just really um, thinking about, I don't know if you're talking about the blood brain barrier or thinking about that, yeah. Vicky. Yeah. Uh, I think in this case, given the size, it, it probably would protect the brain as well for, from that setting. Uh, I think big molecules like this, they, they can get across with brain tumours, but I think mm. with, with bone tumours like this, where the, the blood brain barrier would probably be intact and normal i think it would be a you'd certainly get less crossing yeah the approach yeah thanks so there is also so there is a question now from matt actually um which he is saying that is it known why mmp14 is so overexpressed in osteosarcoma uh, so it's not just in osteosarcoma it's in a lot of different cancers so as I mentioned in breast cancer um, and in malignant um, prostate cancer is that MMP14 is actually shown to be overexpressed. And MMP14 is often responsible for breaking down that extracellular the basement membrane to allow these to metastasize. So in those tumors that are highly metastatic and um, we do see a high degree of MMP14 um, expressed. So. Yeah, um, we, we don't know specifically why it is in osteosarcoma, but as a generalization, and um, we see it in many different types of cancer, not just not just this one. Okay, there was a question from Ali Garden that uh, refers to 
did you know if if all osteosarcomas is uh, is press uh, mmp14 but i guess that answered the question well um, i can actually add to that um so kenneth rankin um who's also associated with bcrt he's done a lot of work on looking at mmp14 in different osteosarcoma yeah. tumors and um he's been looking at this for many years and he's actually found that a lot of mmp14 um although it's not expressed in every single one, it is expressed in the vast majority. Um, and there is differential expression in the way, the place in which it is expressed. So some of it is expressed in the nucleus, some of it on the cell membrane, um, but it is present in the majority of tumors. And do you have increased expression in higher grade tumors? Yes. Yeah. Um, from, from the evidence that is out there, that's what we would say. Yeah. Yeah. So there is all, there's another question related to this from Daryl Green, which is, will you have to modify this approach if the tumor switches to another MMP? Um, so what I can say on that is that there are approaches to target different MMPs. So it doesn't, there aren't ones, not in our lab, because we just focus on the one MMP at the moment, but if we find that our drug is actually selectively cleaved by a different MMP instead, um, a lot of these are also shown to be overexpressed in tumors. So we wouldn't take this as a negative. If anything, um, we still have selective release of a drug, um, even if it is by a different MMP. Um, as long as we can show that it is safer, it is kinder, that we are having fewer side effects, I don't see why that would be problematic. Thank you. So there is the, another question from Kirsty Hogwood, um, and she said, "Do you think it, it is if if this is successful at reducing the more serious side effects of methotrexate, could this be delivered as an outpatient treatment rather than how it is currently as an inpatient?" Um, I can't really comment too much on that. That's more clinical. But um, what I can say is that you do require extensive monitoring whilst you are on chemotherapy treatment so the likelihood of it being an inpatient rather than outpatient um it, it is a possibility i'm not going to rule it out but that would be completely dependent on the actual effects that it had and whether clinicians felt that it was safe to do so okay so this is an unrelated question, but it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's from Professor Sue Bertrand and she said, well, first this is a very nice talk, which I agree. And then she says that uh, in one of your slides, you showed a rapid, within minutes, decrease in tumor levels. Uh, is it known what levels are required to achieve cytotoxicity? And how is it affected? Is this affected by the tumor microenvironment, so, such as hypoxia, for example? Um, I haven't actually looked into hypoxia and how um, this actually impacts the release, but I think I'm just going to read through it again. Um, so very, very large amounts of, methotre um, of methotrexate in itself, you require very high doses um, to achieve the effects that it has. And um, so we would hope that you would be able to reduce the actual dose and because you are able to target it towards the tumour in itself. So it you can release more localized in the tumor rather than affecting and entering other cells within the body. So it would be more targeted. Um, I don't know whether Rob wants to jump in. The, the only thing I would add is I, I know that um, one of Paul's students in a, in a parallel project has looked at um, MMP expression under hypoxic conditions and you can get some quite marked changes. And in fact, MMP 14 is quite massively upregulated under hypoxia. So, um, uh, that kind of answers that, that bit of the question uh, and of course it's not only the the tumor cells the, there's the, the stroma cells and, and also the blood vessels also express the the target as well so there's a there's a lot of complex uh, interactions in the tumor microenvironment that all contribute to the drug being activated yeah um i i have a question of my own actually which relates to this and it's um it's, do, you, do you think it's, is it, is it possible that once methotrexate is released within the tumour, it can go back into circulation? Um, I think the uptake of methotrexate um, is, in, it would be released right up by the cell surface. So the likelihood of it being released to the tumour would be lower than that of it being spread around. So I would say that it would most likely enter the cell um, because of 
the actual localization of it. Um, but I, I wouldn't rule it out as a possibility. Um, but because you are localizing the majority of it into the tumor, you are still having less of side effects than you would see with conventional methotrexate treatment, which is required in massively high doses. So. Yeah. Um, so there's another question again from Matt, and he said, do we know how long the next stage of work could take before we could start to look at clinical trials? Okay, so I wouldn't want to put a time scale on anything that is currently in the basic research level. So we are looking at trying to get it into in vivo studies. And as I mentioned, we, we are looking to actually obtain additional funding for this and to take forward the most successful compounds. And um, I hope that that will be in, in the next couple of years whilst I'm finishing off my PhD within that time frame. But we can't actually say how long it will take to get to clinic. But because methotrexate is also, also is already an approved therapy, um, this should be fast-tracked um, a little bit more than what it would take for a normal drug that is new, completely new, to actually get into the clinic. Okay. Um, I have one more question. Sorry, I got a few questions. Um, because normally, normally the, the treatment of methotrexate tends to be combined with doxorubicin and cisplatin, you know, this MAP kind of combination mm -hmm. therapy, would, would you test that as, are you planning to do that? Because you need to see how your material is working in combination with cisplatin and doxorubicin. Yeah, so I, I believe that would be an end goal. Um, so once it would get into clinic, we would actually assess whether it is viable to still continue with those, yeah. those methods, those regimes. But currently we're focusing more on the actual development and making sure that it is more specific and getting it into those in vivo models. Um, so that we can prove its effectiveness before we get to that stage. Yeah, thank you. I didn't read them, but there's lots of comments saying that this is a very nice work and well done. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone. Just um, one more question from me, actually, but this is actually direct to you, Zoe, so you might just want to take yourself off mute. So, again, it goes back to um, thinking ahead to when the in vivo work is hopefully a success and completed and you're looking at clinical trials, can, could this be bolted on to ICONIC? The it's study that we've already, that obviously we're funding separate to this, so some of the people on here will know of it. So I'm just wondering whether or not that, whether it could be bolted on and that would speed up that process as well. Is that? In theory it could. Um, it would have to go through the kind of early phase trials first. So the things that um, look at safety um, and doses, um, and it, it was whether the timings match up, whether iconic still go in um, at that point. Yeah, yeah in theory. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay, well, it doesn't look like we've got any more questions on, unless anybody wants to. Um, uh, uh, oh, Sue Birch has just said. No, I think I'm just it would be a good idea to see comments from the iconic team. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> um, okay, so we hope you've enjoyed that, everyone, and uh, you're inspired by the work that obviously Hannah and, and Robert are undertaking uh, at Bradford. It's a project that we are incredibly proud of, and like I said at the beginning, it was only made possible because of you know, people like you on this call and uh, on this webinar and our supporters who donated to make it possible. And um, obviously, as Hannah said, uh, the next stage requires further funding, so we'll have to look at that uh, in due course. But, um, but thank you everyone for joining. Uh, next week um, is our sixth uh, webinar. We seem to have like, gone through them really quickly now, uh, which is focusing on chondrosarcoma and um, the progress being made uh, there. And we're going to be joined by Professor Adrian Flanagan. So uh, that's sure to be a really good one as well. So please do join us again. Um, we're finishing up a bit shorter today, um, but uh, thank you all for taking time out of your day and joining us from your living rooms, your kitchens, your bedrooms, or wherever you are. But uh, take care and uh, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.